Good morning, everyone. We'd like to get settled so we can get started with the palliative and end of life committee meeting. We've got a very packed agenda, so we'd like to get started on time. Um, wow, that worked. <laughs> very excited to see that. So um, anyway, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're uh, Dr. Krause and I are here for the uh, Palliative and End of Life Care Committee. We're going to do a little tag team on the um, introductions and presentations. This is our committee, and the uh, teamwork makes the dream work. So you can see that we have quite a large um, and amazing group of people who make us uh, help us make this all work. Um, I don't think that um, I don't think it's lost on any of us here um, how much is going on in our world. And so we wanted to, as uh, palliative care focused best practice communicators, uh, begin our meeting with um, acknowledging the uh, many emotions that are uh, that we are all um, having at the moment and to just take a moment to um, reflect on those uh, those feelings of grief, fear, sadness, despair, or the conflicts that are going on um, in our world. Thank you. And we will hope and pray for uh, better days to come. Uh, I believe uh, Dr. Ben Korn is joining us on our as our one of our committee members from Israel, and so we want to say a special uh, words of peace for you, uh, Ben. So, um, so these are our um, mission and uh, objectives for the Palliative and End of Life Care Committee. As just a reminder, uh, we have been uh, very successful in our first few years and uh, things are continuing to grow. So uh, we will, uh, again, as we prepare for the next uh, grant cycle with uh, Dr. Hirschman uh, and others um, be reevaluating. So any thoughts people have, please uh, continue to share with us. Uh, this is our agenda, which is printed in your program, which is in a printed program. So it's somewhere in the internet there on your app. Um, and uh, we wanted to start first by um, recognizing all the work that the Hope Foundation has done for SWAG. Um, Hope is now 30 years old and has made a tremendous um, impact. We want you to, to um, take note of the QR code to scan and to consider um, giving a donation. We are hoping for um, somewhere close to 100% um, uh, participation. Any small amount is greatly appreciated. It's really about us all um, contributing. And uh, this slide shows you some of the upcoming funding opportunities uh, in our own committee. The Hope Foundation has made um, a tremendous impact by funding a number of our pilot studies, as well as continuing to support us having um, uh, develop, or developing as a community by funding some dinners and travel for speakers. So we are um, eternally grateful. Um, oops. So let's start, uh, this is a little bit sensitive, sorry. Um, let's talk to start our agenda with hearing first from our patient advocates and uh, Carol Siegel be coming up and giving a report. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, Valerie is um, feeling under the weather, so she wasn't able to make it to the meeting. So. Carol is going to be our uh, our wonderful advocate to to give those updates. Right. Yes. Um, Valerie asked me to uh, since she's joining us remotely. Uh, she asked me if I would 
give you an update, share an update with you. And first of all, the patient advocate committee is in the process of a leadership transition. Our longtime and very valued leaders, Rick Bangs and Hildy Dillon, are stepping, are rolling off the committee. And Barbara Segaro Vasquez and Anne Marie Macario will be stepped into these roles. Um, PAC members certainly value Rick and Hildy's leadership and contribution and have a warm welcome for both Barbara and Anne-Marie. <clears throat> As DEI continues to develop it within SWAG, PAC will continue our work with membership, leadership, DEI champions. Currently, there are research projects uh, that are in the works, and they're five, within five committees, breast, GI, GU, lung, melanoma, and the DEI champions will be there to support the pilot, pilot trials in process. I want to remind you about team science. Uh, that's a tool that can provide guidance and support for patient advocate engagement. Module six uh, provides guidance on improving diversity and representation of clinical trial participants. And it's accessible through the SWOG learning management system. Oh, I would also like to remind you that at 2 p.m. today, a diversity, equity, and inclusion town hall is taking place with speaker Christopher Cross, MD, the ASCO DEI leader. Uh, new research advocates joined our team this spring. Tricia Hernandez on the Lymphoma Committee, Daryl Nakagawa on the Bladder Cancer Committee, Karen Costello on the Prostate Cancer Committee, and Lauren Esveller on the Kidney Cancer Committee. We currently have also five very active community advocates representing the Latinx, LGBTQ, adolescent, young adult, and veteran communities. There are five more community uh, uh, positions to be filled, so stay tuned. Community advocates work across the SWAD committees to provide frontline patient view and voice for their communities. I also want to invite you to join Joel, our, J our LGBTQ community advocate, and Lauren, our AYA community advocate, at 5 p.m. today during happy hour as they lead discussions on SWAG community engagement of the community advocates. This is an exciting time for SWAG researchers and advocates. We are honored to be part of the work taking place in this committee for the continued growth and promise of new emerging concepts and patient-centric trials yet to be. Thank you. Thank you. Carol, thank you so much for the report and also for um, being uh, the dedicated advocate that you have been all along before there is even a palliative and end of life committee. <laughs> and um, also thanks to um, Lee and to Valerie um, as they round out our amazing uh, group of advocates. So, um, so we're going to jump now to any committee liaison updates. So our um, amazing Andrea Garcia is um, here in the front. Without Andrea, we would not be uh, appearing to be at the least bit organized and uh, today and throughout the year. So Andrea, thank you. Is there anything that we need to know special from you? <laughs> All right, great, um, thanks so much. Um, I didn't see Melissa. Oh, there you are. Okay. Melissa, do you have um, a report? Did you want to step up to the mic? Is there anything that you needed to uh, to uh, bring to our committee today? I just want to remind everyone that the ORPs, uh, the research professionals, we're available to uh, review your protocol, your concept, your pilot, and give you the feedback from uh, a research professional at a community site's perspective. We're only here to hopefully make your protocol better. So well, thank you. Well, and that you do, so thank you so much. Great. 
um, Jasmine, did you want us to uh, give any reports? So we had were requested last uh, meeting to have a liaison to the AYA committee from our committee. And um, Jasmine Coffey Dunning has uh, graciously agreed to be that liaison. I know you attended yesterday's meeting briefly. And were there any updates that you wanted to bring to the committee today? Okay, great. Um, and then, of course, last but not least is our executive committee member, uh, 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 Dr. Virginia Sun. And I would like you to come up to the microphone because you will then be giving our plenary. So um, why don't you make your way on up and any exec committee updates. And then Dr. Krauss will be um, introducing Dr. Sun as our plenary speaker. Hi, thank you. Um, no real updates, just again, I'm here to serve all of you in our chairs in my um, role as executive officer. So please let us know, let me know if there's anything we can do to help with the research and with the process. So thank you. Okay, so so, um, so Virginia is going to stay up and, and give uh, a plenary on the um, on S1820. And um, so I have a mentor named uh, Marcia Grant. Marcia was head of research at City of Hope for a very long time. And she's helped me quite a bit over the years. And one of the greatest things she did for me was introduced me to Virginia, who became part of our team a long time ago already. And um, I'm very proud on how she, how she's sort of grown and how much swag has meant to her. She's now on the, you know, an executive leadership and she's able to take this study, this idea as an idea. And she'll tell, tell, you know, through a hope foundation funding, and then through a, uh, a, a open trial throughout the, the country is amazing. So we're really excited to hear from her today. Thank you. So switching, <laughs> changing my hat and, and roles. So um, I am here. It's, it's such an honor to be here with everyone, to see everyone. We are here to um, present results from S1820, which is a randomized trial of the Altering Intake Managing Symptoms Intervention, or AIMS RC for bowel dysfunction and rectal cancer survivors compared to a healthy living education control. I know it's a very long title, but it was what, what the IRB wanted us to have. And it's a feasibility and preliminary efficacy study. Here we go. And I, again, want to acknowledge funding from the Hope Foundation, as well as a, um, R21 for the NCI. We couldn't have done this trial without any of the people listed on this um, um, on this page. So really appreciate my co-chairs, Dr. Cindy Thompson at the University of Arizona, who is very well, very well known in the lifestyle behavior change um, area in terms of research. Dr. Tracy Crane, who is actually now at the University of Miami Sylvester Cancer Center, and of course Dr. Robert Krauss. Really, without him, I wouldn't be here at SWOG, so thank you. And um, in our biostatistical team and data operations, thank you so much to Dr. Catherine Guthrie. Thank you, Catherine, for all of your help from beginning to end. And of course, definitely Katie Arnold, um, again, with her details in terms of really making sure that everything went through with quality. Roxanne Passio, really helping, you know, sites answering questions and then connecting the, st the study chair group with um, sites. So very much thank you for all your support. And um, of course, our protocol development coordination team and um, that started with Christy Klepetko and now with Andrea Garcia, thank you so much. Again, I would echo Mar Marie that we cannot do anything without all of you. So really appreciate your help. Dr. Krista Braun Inglis is really our um, representative from the community side of things at the very first day helped us you know, put our protocol together with a community and corp um, sort of um, focus and perspective and really be able to help us make this a success. So thank you. Our patient advocates, Lee Jones and Florence Cotilla. We have um, two GI committee champions, so very much appreciate their support. Um, Dr. Maz and Alcas Pools and Dr. Stacey Cohen from the surgical oncology and medical oncology perspectives. And I also want to thank our um, coaching team, our coordinator team at the University of Arizona's Behavioral Medicine Corps. 
and um, who really help with delivery of the intervention and some of the data collection. So again, can't do it alone. <laughs> so very appreciate everyone's help. Just a very brief background, as many of you know, bowel dysfunction and bowel symptoms are common, persistent, and often irresistible, irreversible after surgery for our um, survivors with rectal cancer, colorectal cancer. Um, the characteristics would include frequent and erratic bowel movements. Patients often oscillate from diarrhea to constipation and also experience um, fecal incontinence, soiling, gas, and bloating. It's really a quality of life issue for our, um, for our patients. From our own data and other, uh, other people's data, we know that more than 50% 50 of survivors experience moderate to severe symptoms one to two years after their surgery and after their treatment. So for many of our survivors, this continues and continue to impact their quality of life. And we know that um, bowel symptoms um, could result in reduced social activities, poor social well-being because of the concerns in terms of be going out to participate in social activities and ultimately poor quality of life. There are a few evidence-based interventions in the last colorectal cancer survivorship guidelines, bowel dysfunction interventions were at level three, which is really case studies and reports only. In our research, and really research based on Dr. Krauss's previous work, um, is funded by several R01s and VA um, funding. We looked at diet modification, and we found that diet modification was one of the most common self-management strategies that our um, patients are using to manage bowel symptom. But this was often done with no guidance. Not everyone have access to a registered dietitian um, support, a trial and error approach, which results in inconsistent symptom control. And in, in, um, in addition to that, the dietary guidelines for cancer survivorship are difficult to achieve in symptomatic survivors. And what we have found, which are quite troubling, is that oftentimes our survivors find that um, important food categories, such as vegetables and fruits, are impacting their bowel symptoms. And those, without the support, they simply stop eating them. Um, and so, and this is perceived as a risk of bowel problems because they are having tolerance and, and bowel um, symptoms based on these food types, which is probably not the best um, recommendation for this population, given that we know that healthy diet and healthy lifestyle does impact their clinical outcomes as well. So we sought to conduct S1820, and the purpose is using a pilot randomized trial design to determine the feasibility acceptability and preliminary efficacy of the AIMS RC intervention for bowel symptom management and post treatment survivors of rectal cancer. Our primary objective is to compare the total bowel function score as measured by the Memorial Sloan Kettering Bowel Function Index, or the MSK BFI, at 18 weeks between the intervention and a attention control arm. And we chose an attention control condition, and I will give a little bit more information about what that looked like. We have a whole host of exploratory objectives. We wanted to look at total, total bowel function score at 26 weeks between the intervention and attention control arms and look at the subscales from the MSK BFI, which covers dietary urgency and frequency at both 18 and 26 weeks post randomization. Um, we, in our, in our anastomosis participants, so we did include participants with a permanent ostomy as well as an anastomosis. We, are, um, we compared low anterior resection syndrome score, a LAR score, quality of life, and dietary quality, which is a 24-hour recall, um, and we were able to come up with the HEI score at both 18 and 26 weeks post-randomization between the two arms. We looked at several other um, factors or variables that, are, that may impact um, the, the diet modification, which include motivation, self-efficacy, and positive negative affect at both 18 and 16, 26 weeks. And of course, we wanted to look at study feasibility, adherence, and retention in all of our study participants, regardless of arms, and also acceptability in the intervention arm at 26 weeks post-randomization. Finally, we explored variations in the primary and secondary study outcomes according to sex and to investigate whether um, intervention effects on the primary outcome differed across these subgroups um, defined by sex. Our eligibility, we focused on uh, patients that um, had a prior history of rectosigmoid colon cancer or rectal cancer, and uh, patients who had a post-surgical permanent ostomy or an anastomosis. 
The patient's last treatment for rectal cancer, any, any surgery, this would be any treatment, any surgery, um, chemotherapy, radiation therapy must be at least six months prior to their registration and not more than 24 months. So we essentially enroll survivors at the six to 24 month post-treatment completion um, time range. Um, for anastomosis patients, they must have a LAR score of 21 to 42, which um, really um, is a definition for minor to major um, low anterior resection syndrome within five calendar days prior to registration. Completion of baseline um, questionnaires. We focused on English speakers for this trial um, primarily, and also patients must be 18 years of age. We stratified um, randomization was dynamically balanced according to sex and ostomy status. So very quickly, um, this is what is the AIMS RC intervention? It is a telephone based um, 10 session telephone call intervention delivered over a six month time frame. And we um, you had different, various different um, types, levels of frequency in terms of the sessions that were delivered, such that in the beginning of the first four months, the sessions are more intense. And as we get closer to the four month time point, the sessions are more spread out. So kind of taking a step back a little bit and, and really supporting the participants use of the diet modification that we had coached them on. We included um, food and symptom diary. We coached our participants to use a symptom food and symptom diary to understand the relationship between the food that they're eating and their bowel symptoms. And we have a um, fully well-developed resource manual or handbook that we provided to the participants with content from the um, intervention. And um, we also, in addition to the intervention sessions for really um, you know, retention and also just engagement purposes. In between the calls, participants received um, emails or telephone text messages that are focused on the AIMS RC intervention. They also received quarterly newsletters for engagement purposes. So we really provided participants with you know, a tool to help them identify the, the relationship between their food and their bowel symptoms, but also did not just rely on telling them, okay, if vegetables are, are difficult for you to tolerate, please stop eating them. Rather, we actually walk through, walk through problem solving skill sets with them and also coach them on how to prepare their food. Perhaps raw broccoli would be a little bit more difficult to tolerate right now. Cut it up, you know, cook it in a different manner. And we also focused on preference. So um, in helping them find food categories that are important for them to um, continue to eat, but also they are wanting to eat and they like to eat. So because that preference piece is important as well. For our control condition, we design a healthy living education atten attention control where we selected 10 survivorship topics that are not dietary, diet modification focused, and also delivered them through 10 telephone sessions over a four month period. And as you can see, we, um, we cover sleep, sun safety, food safety, skin care, active wear, bone health, ACS diet and activity recommendations, and also clinical trials, understanding online resources and screening and surveillance. And also just um, for the AIMS RC intervention, we do take one of the sessions and review healthy living um, guidelines in terms of diet, diet and eating. So that is part of the um, intervention as well. Here's our study schema. So, after baseline, informed consent and baseline um, completion and registration, we had a two-step registration. And following the step one registration, all participants um, went through a 14 to 21 day run-in period. And this was a design built in to um, really study and help with adherence for our participants. What happened during that time frame is um, our participants received a run-in packet with instructions. Um, that included a three-day food and symptom diary as, as well as a postage paid envelope. They, they, they then had a telephone call with our trained coaches and they um, completed 24-hour dietary recall. They were able to provide instructions on completing a three-day food and symptom diary and were given instruction to send it back to the team within seven days of completion. We made the the rules very broad so that many most of our participants are able to complete the run-in, but this was designed to help with um, adherence. 
And so finally, after they completed run-in, they were registered to step two and randomized to either the AIMS RC intervention arm or the attention control arm, which is the healthy living education. All of the intervention sessions were delivered centrally by trained health coaches at the University of Arizona to all the participants around the country. And this, um, these um, health coaches were trained by me and Dr. Cindy Thompson and Dr. Tracy Crane. I actually visited University of Arizona a couple of times to um, provide the training. And we did do intervention fidelity monitoring by way of um, audio recording of the sessions and reviewing them on a regular basis. We had two follow-up time points of week 18 and week 26. Very brief statistical analysis plan. Thank you, Catherine and Katie and Sarah. I know Sarah's here. So um, we were looking at a 74 total participants or 37 per arm um, accrual target that would provide 80% power to detect a 0.5 effect size. So we targeted 94 randomized participants, 47 for, per arm to account for a 22% attrition at week 26. All the, um, the primary endpoint analysis and many of this exploratory outcome analysis were um, completed through linear regression models. And when we looked at adherence and retention, those were assessed by chi-square and acceptability assessed by t-tests. So our trial accrual, just to start with some, some information on how we did, we opened to accrual on December 9th, 2019 and closed to randomization on April 28th, 2022. So an R21, about two years um, time frame, in and uh, in the middle of COVID, thankfully we, we didn't really have to shut down the study. We made some adjustments as many of our protocols did and were able to continue to enroll. So thank many thanks to the sites. We had 39 NCORP, NCT, and member institutions participate in enrollment. 30 of these were community um, institutions and nine academic institutions across 17 states and the U.S. Territory of Guam. So we are very proud that we were able to enroll participants. Thank you, Krista, and thank you for the, um, the Hawaii um, NCORP for helping with that. We ultimately consented 117 participants to pre-randomization run-in. Sorry, the, the N went away a little bit. We had 19% um, weren't eligible for randomization. Probably, you know, many of them did not complete the run-in, um, weren't able to, for example, to provide the food and symptom diary. We ended up with 93 participants that were randomized, 47 to the AIMS RC intervention and 46 to the healthy living education arm. This is just a, dis a graphic display of our accrual over time. Um, just like many trials, we started a little bit slow in, in beginning with um, late December of 2019 and then January through January 2020. But as you can see, when we did really well, we did pretty good. We had up to 11 um, participants enrolled in some of the months. So some, some select sociodemographic and clinical characteristics. There were no significant difference, differences in, for any of these um, characteristics across the two arms. We had um, a median age of about 54 in the intervention and 56 in attention control. So not surprisingly, given this is um, a colorectal population with uh, unfortunately seeing more and more incidents in a younger population. Um, we um, need to do better in terms of diversity in our accrual. As you can see here, we have about 81, 85% particip participants that are white. And um, time since diagnosis was about 23 to 22 um, median, and these are months, and time since surgery as well. So many of them are about 15 to 13 months out from their surgical treatment. Our um, rectal cancer diagnosis was the primary um, diagnosis for our participants. We had about, um, you know, a little, a smaller group of ostomy participants, but they were relatively equal, you know, represented across both arms based on the stratification. We did ask many of our participants about any medications that are already using to help with bowel symptoms. And we do see that many of them are taking, not surprisingly, antidiarrheal medications, constipation medications, and some with probiotics. All right, here we go. So for our primary objective, so this is the bowel function index total score. Um, we did not see a statistically significant difference between the two arms and higher scores here indicate better bowel function. My apologies, this is a little bit smaller. For our exploratory objectives, we did see um, statistical significance in the BFI frequency 
subscale that was completed only by anastomosis participants, as well as in the LAR score, again, um, only completed by the anastomosis participants. So I, I do wanna point out that these are exploratory objectives, but it does give us food for thought in terms of next step, which we will talk about. And as you can see for the LAR score, um, participants in both arms started with um, really a LAR score that indicates major low anterior um, resection syndrome. For our intervention arm um, at week 18 and week 26, they actually moved to minor. So, um, but again, these are exploratory objectives. We did not see any statistical difference in all of our other um, exploratory objectives, including motivation, self-efficacy, and positive and negative affect. We did very well with trial adherence, retention, and acceptability. So as you can see here in terms of adherence, for more than 97% in both groups um, of participants completed follow-up after randomization. So that's, we're very um, happy with that. In terms of retention, which we're looking at completion of follow-up assessments, we, um, we also had, oh, sorry, the, the, the retention is more than 97% in both groups that completed follow-up. And for the adherent, it's more, uh, nine, more than 95% of participants in both groups completed sessions one to five in at least three of sessions six through 10. And in terms of acceptability, we saw a um, higher acceptability that was statistically significant in the intervention arm at both week 18 and week 26. All right, lessons learned. We were able to show that SWOG S1820 in our intervention, AIMS RC, was highly feasible and acceptable. We need to do a better job in terms of making our participant pool more diverse in terms of enrollment. Um, again, we did not see any statistical significance in primary objective um, with just two exploratory objectives, targeting um, questionnaires and items that were completed only by anastomosis participants. So some thoughts that we had discussed and as a team for on many of our calls, we still meet pretty much on a regular basis, sometimes every other week, but still weekly, we maintain those calls. Um, you know, we we may we have seen a wide variance in terms of time since surgery, as you can see in the um, sociodemographic and clinical characteristics table, and this may have resulted in wide variance in bowel function adjustments. Um, we are we were targeting survivors that are six to twenty four months post treatment, and we know that many participants had adjusted in terms in, to some um, way or another, and so again there is a variation. We have talked about the potential of moving the intervention closer to surgery and treatment completion. We've had heard this um, as comments in um, some of our coaching calls. We are gonna be looking at those qualitative data and proposing to do that as, as a potential third paper. We have two papers that we're already in the process of working on and to be submitted or resubmitted. And so perhaps moving the intervention closer when um, really participants are perhaps dealing with more of the challenges of bowel control and bowel symptoms would be something to think about. Run-in protocol, commonly used in behavioral interventions, but sometimes that may have increased diet awareness, even though we did not cover much of the diet um, coaching and the diet modification components in the um, attention control condition. We also discussed more sessions over a longer period of time. Maybe the sessions could be shorter or, um, but more you know, over a longer period of time to really balance healthy eating and bowel symptom management. Again, we're gonna be looking at our coaching calls because there may be some indication there in terms of how to balance, again, the healthy eating component as well as the bowel symptom management by way of um, the, bowel mod the, the diet modification that um, we are coaching participants on in this intervention. So happy to think, have, see if anyone have any thoughts in terms of next steps. We, we do um, feel like from our acceptability data that we heard from our participants that this is something that they see favorably. And so um, we wanna be thinking about other steps and see whether we can continue, continue this work um, in the future. And finally, I wanna thank all of our enrolling institutions. Thank you, thank you so much. Without you, we wouldn't be able to enroll and um, be able to do it in a relatively timely fashion. And um, so thank you. I'm happy to take any calls, any suggest of any, any you know, suggestions or any comments. Is it? 
So we do have some love for you on the <laughs> chat for your uh, congratulations uh, enrollment during COVID-19. Uh, we are all, uh, you know, very uh, envious of your ability to continue to do that. So thank you. I uh, just want to commend you on your study. This is certainly a quality of life issue for those patients. I would really like to see you uh, put forth all of your demographics related to diversity. Uh, I acknowledge that you did comment that that was a weakness, but we should not just report Caucasians ever. We need to report all of it. And I think Thank it's you. going to be particular to have a plan to ensure representativeness, particularly around food when culture can really impact diet. So I'd love to see that, particularly if you need any help going forward in a study to plan on diversity and learning from those groups. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate the comment. Absolutely. We um, are thinking about and have been thinking about how to um, really be more inclusive in terms of the way we approach, be thinking about the different types of food people you know, prefer and will be eating. So thank you so much. I will definitely be connecting with you. <laughs> Hi, Don. Congratulations, Don. Can, I don't know if you can hear. Yeah, okay. Uh, congratulations on completing this important study. I always wonder when we do pilot studies and feasibility studies, if we should really even be reporting power um, because the intent is to try to find the right patient, the right question, the what's the meaningful difference. And it's, it wasn't really designed as a Right. efficacy study, you know, efficacy study, otherwise it would be five times as big, right? So, right. you know, really trying to figure out setting ahead of time, like what the criteria is for success so that people have the context to put that in because we're so geared towards, is a P significant? Like what's, right. you know, do or what are, you know, where is one for, for this, the intent was, can we do it in SWAG? Can we, you know, can we, you know, run a randomized trial in this patient population, can we accrue? Like those are the meaningful endpoints for a study like this. Um, and then, you know, when you look, whenever you look at group means like that, it's like you, you sort of mentioned it, but like the percentage of patients that have a meaningful change, you know, to try to get you geared towards how do you take this data to the next phase in terms of a, a larger trial. Thank you. We will definitely be looking at that. We've had several discussions already and we'll continue to have discussions, but thank you so much. We, I think in terms of, can we do this? I think we we have pretty good data to show that we can um, in terms of being able to complete the sessions across the country with a centralized intervention, and then also having participants tell us by way of the acceptability that they did see value in this, so. Well, um... Again, Virginia, congratulations to you and your massive team. And um, this is just the beginning, not the yes. end uh, of, of this work. And so we look forward very much to seeing you um, present again after the, um, the big R01. Thank you. <laughs>
Oh, I think we have passed one of the slides. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Are we missing a slide? Well, I don't think it's missing. We're just going to, doesn't seem to be popping up, which it did. Okay. Um, no problem. Well, um, before you share that, I'll just orally say things that I don't think is going to be surprising to this audience, which is caregivers represent a massive population of folks uh, delivering the majority of care to patients with advanced cancer who unsurprisingly have many unmet needs and they're often highly distressed. So in terms of numbers, we're talking about 3.3 million folks according to the 2020 National Survey conducted by the National Alliance for Caregiving, likely an underestimate of the number of uh, families caring for loved ones with advanced cancer. They're performing very complex symptom and medication management uh, that's getting ever more complex over time. And uh, because of things like COVID and other pressures to decrease the length of time patients are in the inpatient setting, more of this care is being delivered in the home. And so we're now relying on these family members uh, to now deliver very complex uh, cancer care, most of whom are untrained. Um, and uh, an a, per a person with advanced cancer, uh, those families are typically providing on average about 11 hours of care per day uh, over a period of about 18 months. This is often on top of being employed, either part or full time. So it's the equivalent of taking on another full time job uh, for many folks on top of another actual full-time job uh, in order to take care of these individuals. It can be highly distressing, no surprise there, um, with up to half experiencing distress at levels that are greater than uh, the uh, average population, which uh, has been shown to have an impact on care that they can deliver to patients. Now, distress screening, many of you may be familiar with NCCN, uh, distress screen guidelines commonly using a, a distress mm -hmm. thermometer uh, that has been shown to benefit patients. Uh, we have adapted that now to an intervention that we call Family Strong. Um, and yet it's not been uh, tested yet in a, in a clinical trial setting, albeit there are cancer centers who uh, have modified this thermometer for families. So next slide. So Family Strong is, is what we're calling it today. It, it includes a distress thermometer assessment that is specific to family caregivers. It offers problem support and is designed to be effective at lessening caregiver distress. It's very brief, and we believe because of that is very highly scalable. It's initiated uh, early on at any point in the advanced cancer trajectory, and it has a long-term follow-up. It can be delivered by a range of health professionals. We uh, designed this intervention to be delivered by lay health coaches uh, with the rationale that if it can be delivered by these folks, it could be uh, delivered by anybody. Next image. It uses a toolkit that includes resources that are tailored to whatever the local cancer center is and the resources available in their area. And finally, click. This, uh, it uses a monthly distress screening instrument that you can see a little image up here. I know you can't read it, but it includes, uh, it should look virtually the same as the NCC and patient distress thermometer, except the problem areas are specific to family caregiving. It also includes a step-by-step -step process for the interventionist or clinician to deliver problem-solving support, whether it's resource referral, uh, connection to resources, or connections to already existing services and supports that family members completely already know about. Next. I'm getting a message in the chat that folks are unable to see slides, just if I, I. So we developed this study, the title of which is Distress Screening for Family Caregivers of Persons with Advanced Cancer, Family Strong Randomized Clinical Trial. Next. Um, so uh, just, uh, Nick, according to one of our participants, um, if people can't see the slides remotely, um, they can click on the IMS operator and select PIN and it'll keep the slides in view while you are talking. So we can see them fine here in the room, but if people can't see them on Zoom, then that's what they need to do and they'll see them. So 
Sorry, sorry to to interject. Yeah, that's all good. Like, so we designed this as a type one hybrid implementation effectiveness randomized controlled trial. I don't want this to sound too complex. It's a two arm randomized controlled trial that has an implementation uh, exploratory aim that I'll describe in a second. The sample is currently set at 300 family caregivers and their care recipients who advance cancer. It will include SWOG member cancer centers in this trial. The intervention again will be lay navigator led and centralized at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, where we'll perform monthly telephonic caregiver distress screenings and problem support over 24 weeks to uh, dispense. Primary outcome will be caregiver distress 24 weeks as measured by the hospital anxiety and depression scale. Secondary outcomes will include dis patient distress, quality of life for both patients and caregivers. Burden is reported by caregivers and healthcare utilization uh, for patients. Here is a schema of this two-arm trial. Uh, half will be randomized to family strong and half to usual care. Data collection will uh, be over 24 weeks with a baseline 12 and 24 week time point. Next. And here is our amazing team. Uh, thank you to everyone listed there. Here is the timeline. We submitted to PAR 21035 NCI in, uh, about two weeks ago, actually about seven days ago. Mm -hmm. And the merit review will be in October and November of 2023. So uh, we'll see how we did uh, when those months pass. Council, should it receive a potentially fundable score, will be in January 2024 with a tentative start date of July 2024. If we do not get funded, we will likely resubmit for that same July cycle or earlier. Mm. Oh, um, Nick, uh, the merit review, I think, is probably not correct because... Oh, that is yeah, it doesn't look right. Yeah. I got off the website. I'll have to double check. Sorry. Yeah. It's probably a, so it's probably a January, February merit review. The council probably will meet in May. Yeah. It'll be a it'd still be a July start date. Um, that would be lovely if that's the way it did happen, the way it says on your slide, but um okay. Uh, that's <laughs> Great. So in the last session, there were some conversations about um, carrying out studies that do have caregivers um, uh, in them and having been the expert um, in this area. Um, this is now the third um, large R01 uh, um, uh, enrolling caregivers with their patients. Um, I encourage any of our investigators in the audience who are Wondering how you do this, um, please see Nick after the uh, meeting and he will tell you how it is done. So, um, are there any questions? So, yeah, one question here. Your time. My, my question is basically, we've been having problems recruiting caregivers in, in the other studies. Um, what and maybe, I'm not sure that he's aware of that. So what comments do you have about uh, new strategies and how do you think this will be different? I think this will be different because the intervention is for them. So this study isn't just collecting data from caregivers, it's an actual support. And the why of this study is different. The why is because we are trying to develop a comprehensive program of support that directly supports families caring for patients. So the benefit is directly to them. And most families, feel unseen and unvalidated in their typical role in their cancer care. So we've been very successful at the messaging and framing of this study to help care families and caregivers understand that we are in fact trying to advance how we better support them. And that's, yeah. that's the framing and messaging that we have. My sense is that most studies recruit families to collect data and that's about it. And that those studies, Rightfully so, we're very patient focused. Just building on um, Jeff's comment, I still think we're going to need to have a plan for recruitment because even like some of the other trials that have had a caregiver intervention, 
we've had some difficulty and a typical screening does not focus on, you know, caregiver screening. It's more like patient screening. So just to have a plan for recruitment, because I think it's super important and a great study. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. We will have a plan. <laughs> Great. And we also have, um, as you can see on the slide, both Carol and Valerie, our advocates, have been um, helping to participate. Um, also, um, Dr. Sun has been um, been an advisor for thinking about the, the practical, the practicalities of this. So we will, um, and there's also a nurse liaison uh, who is working on that very topic. So um, I think we're all aware and um, you know, you never know what happens when you get there, but uh, I think there's been a lot of due diligence, so we'll keep our fingers crossed. Okay, okay. moving on. Great. Moving on. Um, so Jonathan Sham, if you would like to come up to the podium, uh, he's going to present uh, S2408, randomized multi-center placebo-controlled trial evaluating lanreotide for the reduction of post-operative pancreatic fistula. Hi, good morning, all. Pardon me. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, good morning. Again, I'm Jonathan Shem. I'm a surgeon and researcher uh, in Seattle at the Fred Hutch Cancer Center, University of Washington, and just giving you a brief update uh, on our concept. Um, you can see the uh, pertinent members of the study team here. Uh, for a Brief background for those of you who aren't pancreas surgeons in the room, pancreas, uh, postoperative pancreatic fistula or pancreas leak is really the defining complication after pancreas surgery. You know, the pancreas is a gland. It secretes enzymes into the intestine to help digest food. When we cut the pancreas, these enzymes can leak out into the abdominal cavity, digesting internal tissues, causing bleeding, infection, sepsis, longer hospital stays, delayed chemotherapy, all sorts of terrible things. Lenreotide uh, is a somatostatin analog. Uh, this is a drug that reduces pancreatic secretions. And the idea is that we can give this around the time of surgery. We can reduce the incidence of pancreatic leak uh, and improve outcomes. Uh, we performed a phase two trial uh, at UW, which showed, uh, in a, it was a single arm, but showed a leak rate of 3%. And that's compared to a historical rate of 25%. Uh, and so then this therefore uh, led to the development of this concept. Um, you can see here the schema. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Katie, Catherine, for all the help with the stats. Uh, 274 patients accounting for about a 10% dropout. Very straightforward study, one-to-one. -one. Half the patients get uh, lanreotide, a single dose in the preoperative holding area. The other just gets standard of care. They undergo surgery, and then we evaluate leaks. Uh, the leak rate, uh, the, the definition of a leak is a very codified uh, entity uh, by the ISGPS International Study Group for Pancreatic Fistula. I can go into all the details, but essentially it's a drain amylase greater than three times the upper limit of normal of your institutional value, plus some type of change in care, antibiotics, drain placement, endovascular intervention, et cetera. Um, the patient population is quite broad, and we think this is quite appealing uh, for the study design because it helps with feasibility. Essentially, anyone undergoing a distal pancreatectomy for uh, malignant or pre-malignant lesions, that would be cancer or high-risk pancreatic cysts, IPMNs, MCNs, things like that. Uh, and then you can see the stats there. Um, here are the endpoints again, so so-called clinically relevant postoperative pancreatic fistula, that's the yellow and red boxes on the right side there. So again, if you have a high drain amylase and any change in your management, you keep the drain in a long time, greater than three weeks, you get antibiotics, you get a drain, um, or if you have uh, other signs of infection without organ failure, and then these are pretty rare, but do happen, reoperation, organ failure, or death would be a grade C. Our secondary endpoints are that green box at the top, so-called like a mini leak, a biochemical leak, uh, number of post-operative hospital days, and then some quality of life metrics, which have been validated in this population preoperatively, 14 days and 60 days. Um, and then again, some other exploratory endpoints, um, uh, such as DGE or delayed gastric emptying and, and hemorrhage, those occur at higher rates when fistula occurs, which is why we think it's interesting to look at. And then, uh, 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 very important to a lot of, well, to us and our medical oncology colleagues, uh, time to initiation of adjuvant chemotherapy for those patients who do have cancer. 
We think this is a really appealing study because of the broad inclusion criteria, um, really mostly standard of care other than the drug injection and the three quality of life evaluations. It's, it's just all standard of care. And so we think that that's, again, really appealing for sites. We um, presented this to the steering committee, uh, the symptom control quality of life steering committee on the 26th. Literally 15 minutes before I came up here, we got the letter back uh, saying it was pending. Uh, and so I can't give you, I'm literally just digesting this uh, still. I can't give you all the details. I, I put here the placebo and blending is what I thought they were going to have an issue with. But of course, like all these things, they had questions about other stuff. Um, and while I viewed this as fairly daunting. Dr. Krauss assured me right before this meeting that this was good news. Um, so uh, again, I, I don't know if we want to go through everything, but yeah, happy to answer any questions um, uh, about the study, but we're, we're in route. So, you know, from the steering committee, you're in, you're out, you're pending. And, and the pending was a long letter some of it was things that they missed that were there, some things that they recommended or requested some, you know, further information on or clarification. But they do start out saying this is really important. And that is great for this study. I'm confident this study will happen. It'll take some work, but but this study will, will happen uh, due to, you know, a lot of things, a lot of people, and of course, Jonathan's hard work. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think just two things to, to, to remote because I think perhaps they're most pertinent for this group here. Uh, one is, uh, you know, we initially took out the, you know, when I, when I first wrote this up two years ago, we had matching, you know, double blind placebo control. And when we kind of, when I worked with Su Fun Wang to, to look at um, the feasibility of that, it was pretty clear that given this is a generic drug, the drug company is not going to pay for, for placebo and the placebo was going to cost about three to $400,000 to make. That wasn't going to happen. Um, and so we went to just a non-blinded, non-placebo controlled. However, it looks like they do want some type of blinding. And so again, there's different levels of blinding and placebo, as you can see. I think we're we're erring towards having this the surgeon and patient blinded, but perhaps not a uh, research nurse or, or or some other person at the site who can administer a non-matching placebo, just saline in a syringe, two cc's under the skin. Again, the surgeon doesn't know, the patient doesn't know, uh, and that will, I think, uh, be the simplest, most cost-effective, uh, you know, maintain the kind of research integrity. Uh, and, and while the primary endpoint is uh, relatively objective, some of the secondary endpoints, including the quality of life, could theoretically be affected by the lack of blinding. So this is one, you know, one of the bullets that that was at the steering committee. They were it was one of the questions or suggestions. It was one of the bullets. You might want to reconsider this. When they say that, it means you know, do it. And 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 the Jonathan's right. It's a fairly simple thing. And and then once it's approved, we see how it goes. I mean, we may need an amendment if it holds up accrual, but it's ultimately. You know, creating a, a placebo injection is meaningless because what does a patient know as far as what a, a needle uh, injection looks like? They may not even see it because it's injection in their bottom. So it's probably a pretty simple gift that we can just, uh, you know, put into the protocol. I guess the main question I guess I have for, for anyone here um, in looking, and again, I'm sorry, I haven't fully digested this, um, just regards engaging the engagement of in core sites uh, and non high volume centers, uh, and uh, certainly developing a plan for recruiting minority populations, which we did ag address in, in the steering committee presentation, but really kind of codifying that. Um, but also just understanding that a lot of these surgeries are done in high volume centers, but we want to make this as pragmatic and feasible as possible. So we want to you know, not have it be site limited and include everyone. And, and, and these surgeries are happening in the community. Absolutely. But just kind of finding a way to, to balance feasibility uh, and, and it reassure the, the steering committee that, that we can accrue at non lapse sites essentially. And so again, any, any points people have on that, I'd love to take away just so I can, you know, put this in writing and, and hopefully move it over the finish line. 
So just to also reiterate, this is where S1316 also helps. And our randomized component was over 30% African-American participants, over 20% in the entire study. We have a network in place, and we're just going to need to clarify that better for them to show how we can address these issues. Right. I think, I mean, I think having a few community sites that do a large number of um, these surgeries, whether it's Kaiser or some of the other networks, it, just the non traditional high volume academic sites is North, really North what they well, want to yeah, see. Yeah. Like, and so having a few letters really going into, you have a lot more space. So really going into the details about what your experience has been on prior trials, but getting those letters and sites already lined up that have more diverse patient populations that are less high volume academic sites, I think, well, you know, they just want to be reassured. So thank you. I just wanted to point out that um, to me, the more the more important change that I think they're asking for, I think they gave us an out on the blinding, which is really not simple, Robert, it's not at all. Um, and so we really have to talk about that, but that's for another day. Um, but the real change they're talking about is, is what kinds of surgeries to include. And you wanted to only include the sort of more straightforward surgery, which I thought make a lot, make a lot of sense. But now they want you to include the other kind, which I cannot say. I don't think. How do you right. say? Yeah. So, PE so and when I, again, PE and I'm, I'm still digesting this. I, I didn't I get the sense. They just wanted justification for why we didn't include the oh, Whipples. So? Okay. Um, okay. It, and it just says implications of studying, of not studying right. Whipples should be provided. I see. Okay. And well, that's so, what they said too about blinding. Like if, if you can't do it, then at least justify why you can't do it. And, and yeah. Okay. So you don't feel like that's a demand that we need to. No, do. no, no. That's not how I read this again. I'm good. 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 I'm new okay. at this, but yeah, I know too. I'm still sk skimming it. And that would, and that would um, materially change the study and numbers yeah, in a way that right, is make it feasible. But yeah, I, I, I see this yeah, as just right. explain more why. And I think that, uh, I can do a better job in for like a non-surgeon population in particular, right. really parse out the differences and why yeah. we chose one. Because yeah. you know, we did it for statistical reasons mainly, but there are actually a lot of yeah, there are a lot of conceptual physiologic oh, reasons why it makes sense to study just distals as well. Um, but I think the harder question is they're like, well, if you do the study and they ask this yeah. at the presentation, yeah. surgeons are going to start giving this for Whipples as well. Yeah. And that study will never be done. Yeah. And so they're like, it's an, it, they even say surgeons, if it's shown to be effective, surgeons may expand this use in Whipple, which further reduce the likelihood of conducting a clinical trial in that patient population. So essentially explain the implications. Yeah. That's, that's, I, that's I think that's hard to, to explain, like, yeah, well, explain yeah. that, but, and, but maybe, yeah. yeah. I'd be interested in people's opinions about that. Well, yeah. I mean, it's true. It, it will have implications right. on Whipple procedures. Right. Right. And you explain it, and that study may never happen. Although that's uh, you know potentially a goal right. down the line. Right, right. It's tough. Yeah. Okay. Again, I, I'm not an implementation science expert. <laughs> I, I I don't know how to say, like how to comment on the future of something right. not happening, uh, and and right. how well, how to how to account for that. But if right, yeah, I'm, I'm all ears for right. anyone does. If this is successful, then it can be studied in that other setting. Yeah, like, I know. I well, that's what we only tried to say. One question. Correct. Yeah. With this study, correct. Correct. That's what correct. You're correct. Maybe this study yeah, would be, be nearly... as black and white as possible. That's great. Right, and yeah. it's this study might not be as feasible if we if we widen that eligibility. So, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I was just going to state the obvious that a number of our uh, minority and underserved NCORs are in high volume centers like Columbia and VCU that serve a large minority population. So, uh, you know, community has lots of meanings in the NCOR program. And, and I think you have to go after those centers, even if they're not traditional um, SWAG members. So we have one last comment, and then Dr. Kim, if you want to make your way up to the podium, that would be great. Uh, I was just going to suggest that perhaps it's a help to turn to the National Pancreas Foundation uh, for accrual purposes and 
uh, they have, I think, at this point, about 170, maybe, but don't quote me, certified centers. And I noticed that looking at them, many of them are in, uh, you know, they're not all in urban centers, maybe in more rural settings, uh, which might provide a more diverse population. That's a great recommendation. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. So thank you, Jonathan. So so next we're moving on. Um, Dr. J. Kim, City of Hope, um, is going to be presenting a study that hopefully a grant will go in uh, after the new year. Phase three trial of telehealth intervention for self-management of eating after uh, gastroesophageal cancer surgery. Okay. Hi, good morning. Um, so I think this will be a, kind of a quick update. Um, the study title is a telehealth intervention for personalized self-management tips for eating after gastroesophageal cancer surgery. Um, so just a reminder, this is um, the design is a phase three uh, multi-center randomized trial of a telehealth intervention for um, self-management for uh, eating symptoms after curative intent gastric and or esophageal cancer surgery. Um, the, uh, the intervention is currently designed as four dietitian-led telehealth sessions uh, after surgery, and the patients are enrolled um, within one month of resuming oral intake after their operation. So if they have surgery and they start eating again five days after, it's within 30 days of that uh, time frame. Um, and then the sessions are carried out over four months. And the primary endpoint is um, quality of life at six months. And um, we're using um, an overall quality of life endpoint from the ERTC QLQ C30. Um, it's a summary score, which combines um, many of the uh, symptom and functional scores um, in that uh, in that measure. So the, this is the schema. Um, the uh, inclusion criteria are basically anybody who's had curative intent surgery for gastric or esophageal cancer, and they began eating in the last month, um, adults. And then the intervention, um, we have trained dietitians who speak Mandarin, Spanish, and English. So it'll be um, any of those three languages and ability to participate in telehealth. So, um, and we're doing the um, telehealth session centrally administered at City of Hope. Um, and then the, the control arm will be um, basically uh, usual care. We're calling it enhanced usual care because they are gonna be given, the patients in the control arm are gonna be given um, an eating hints uh, booklet that's published by NCI, which is um, advice for uh, eating, and diet uh, during cancer treatment and after cancer treatment. And um, we've currently designed the primary endpoint to be assessed at six months. Um, Catherine uh, Guthrie, who we've been working with, has had some really good suggestions about perhaps um, doing an earlier endpoint as well. So we're considering having um, a secondary endpoint looking at four month uh, outcomes. Um, and we'll be looking at um, self-efficacy measures as well, and some uh, objective measures of nutrition, weight, albumin, and skeletal mass and muscle index um, based on uh, CT scan images at six months. So um, currently we're aiming for um, submission as an, as an R1 to the NCI in February. Um, so that's our goal. And, we're hoping to get um, all our ducks in uh, in order uh, prior to that. So I think that's all I have. Any any questions about the study? Um, Are there any lessons learned from Virginia's trial that will inform this study? I know it's different, but there yeah. are some similarities. Same, yep. Yes. So um, 
Great question. And so Virginia has um, been uh, really guiding me through this process and um, and Robert has also given great uh, advice and mentorship. So a few things. Well, one, you know, we moved the intervention to shortly after surgery rather than starting it looking at the long-term survivors. Um, so, you know, we're, and, and this is really the period where uh, patients struggle the most and um, speaking with our patient advocates, um, they like the idea of starting it early. Um, uh, so that's one thing. And then they, um, another thing was, um, I, I, I kind of thinking about the, the endpoints, um, you know, uh, and we've gotten kind of back and forth about what's the what's the ideal endpoint. Often, it's hard to show um, a difference in um, overall quality of life um, for for studies. Um, but we, I think we also think that might be in our um, pilot study. We actually had um, some signal there uh, for that outcome, and we think that um, that might be easier to get funded than looking at um, one specific domain or um, quality of life measure. Okay. Um, there is one question in the chat. Uh, Dr. Kim, and we'll be the last one before we move on to oh, great. have our next speaker um, come up is um, our CT scans standard of care in this population? Yes. So one of the reasons we chose this six-month endpoint is because that's typically about when patients get their uh, follow-up imaging for surveillance. And so we will only be using the standard of care CT scan images. Um, and we were able to do that in our pilot. Great. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. One last. Let's talk about some objective like measures of um, how folks are doing with the intervention, maybe looking at like frequency of anti-emetic use, anti-diarrheal use, maybe weight also as a um, some objective markers of. Yes, uh, yeah. we did look at weight and we're including that, but I think um, that's a really good point in terms of um, use of these other uh, medications. And that's something that um, uh, we should also include in the uh, baseline assessment as well. Great. Okay. So the next person is Dr. Rauf here. I saw him earlier. So uh, Dr. Rauf, um, another City of Hope person um, who um, will be presenting and explaining PIPEC to everybody uh, in refractory colorectal appendiceal carcinomatosis potential uh, study. Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm a surgical oncologist at City of Hope, and um, I'm going to be talking about PIPEC and a concept related to that. So I have some disclosures. So um, I'll give an overview of PIPAC. Um, as a lot of folks may not be familiar with it, it's a newer uh, technology to treat peritoneal metastases. And um, you know, just by the way of background, we know peritoneal metastases have poor prognosis. Um, a lot of patients are not candidates for surgery. Surgery is helpful. Um, however, uh, there's high morbidity from surgery. We've gotten better at doing cytoreductive surgeries, um, and we've gotten better at doing sequencing. But the challenge remains that most patients are not candidate for surgery, and there's no le level one evidence to support um, HIPEC treatment, particularly for colorectal and appendiceal cancer, which is the main regional therapy. Um, there's a, a lot of other regional therapy approaches that have been used, but high quality evidence has been lacking for those. And the, the folks who've been treating these, this patient population have seen some value in it, which is why it has persisted through several decades. So um, in terms of what's new for peritoneal metastases, I think enhanced delivery methods um, are important other than um, personalization and drug uh, candidates that need to be developed. So this is PIPAC. It's given laparoscopically at the time um, uh, of laparoscopy through small incisions. You can put the injector and air slicer in, and then uh, over 30 minutes, the drug is nebulized. The advantage is that it's done under pressure. There's homogeneous drug distribution. So it's a more optimized way of delivering therapy. With every laparoscopy, you can actually 
visualize the disease and dig biopsies and allows for a rich uh, translational research platform as well. So early reports, this was published in 2019 for many European centers, repeated some encouraging data. Um, you know, they reported clinical responses in a substantial number of patients and clinical response is a very vague endpoint that has been reported in those studies. So there's not a real um, understanding of if this therapy is beneficial or not. But what we learned was it's feasible, it's repeatable, it preserved quality of life and this adverse events were on the lower side compared to systemic therapy. There's some uh, images from, from the big model on the left is lavage and on the right side is distribution pipex on the earlier generation devices. You can see there's more drug deposited and that's mostly by function of, um, you know, with lavage, you remove the drug after you give the drug. And with pipex, there's dwelling indwelling drug, but the newer device is much better with homogeneous distribution of um, drugs. So this is a setup at the time of surgery, you take biopsies and we use balloon trocars so that the aerosol doesn't leak out into the operative operating room environment. There's best practices established now. This has been going on for uh, close to seven years uh, in, in many, many centers across the world. So there's a lot of standardization of this approach. And then after that, we deliver the aerosol chemotherapy. Everybody leaves the operating room. And this is how it looks. It looks like a snowstorm in the abdomen. So there's uh, some, uh, a number of phase one trials that have established uh, maximum tolerated dosages for different therapies. And the key ones are listed over here. Um, essentially, doxorubicin cisplatin, for uh, some unknown reason, was the first choice of therapy. But oxaliplatin and napaclitaxel have been established safe. And there's a number of phase two studies. All of them are in Europe. So we started this study at City of Hope where we enrolled refractory patients. So you have ARM1 and ARM2. ARM1 is ovarian cancer, uterine, and gastric. It's done, led by my co-principal -invest, co investigator, Dr. Dellinger at City of Hope. And ARM2 is colorectal appendiceal, which I will be discussing today, um, where patients received oxaliplatin, PIPEC, and they received a 5-FU leucovorin dose of um, sensitizing dose of uh, IV chemotherapy at 400 milligram per meter square. It was given at, at, uh, before second and third pipec, not uh, with the first pipec. So the idea was to establish dose limiting toxicities. We stuck to the dose that was established safe in European cohorts, and this is to see if we can reproduce their experience. So ARM2 has been complete, has been reported. Um, so these are patients who've, who've progressed on first two lines of chemotherapy and uh, colorectal and, and um you know, high-grade appendiceal is most of the cohort. And so 100% um, got one cycle, 58% got two cycles, and 50% got three cycles. There were no surgical complications or, or those limiting toxicities seen. There are a number of grade one and grade two toxicities uh, visualized. Um, and so here you can see the efficacy signal. We saw that uh, two patients um, went on to have cytoreductive surgery, um, by independent uh, surgical groups uh, who thought that they would be candidates for surgery after buyback treatment. Um, about half the patients stable disease radiographically. We saw a decrease in uh, PCIs in about 50% of patients and histologic response was also similar. Response assessment is challenging in this patient population. It's hard to know what that means. Um, here we show some data that the radiographic response, uh, laparoscopic response, somewhat correlates with radiographic stable disease, but histologic response was all over the place, which is what the clinical benefit in European studies had been reported at. So, so I think there's some value, but not based on the histologic response. And in terms of evaluating what response criteria is bad, the radiographic response criteria was really the best in, in terms of correlating with overall survival in this patient cohort. I think this is a meaningful endpoint here. So we took uh, the SWOC 1316 good days endpoint and uh, extended the definition from 91 days to uh, two different definitions at six months and one year. This was not a pre-specified endpoint. This is um, exploratory uh, and post hoc analysis. So what we found, uh, we looked at the systemic therapy cohort at our institution um, of consecutive 20 patients who would be eligible for buyback except that they were not enrolled on the study. Um, most common reason was because they had adhesive disease and they were not amenable to laparoscopy. So we thought that was a comparable cohort. 
And you can see um, on the right hand side, the blue bars indicate the hospitalization and the gray bars indicate their survival. And you can see the PIPEC cohorts generally have um, better survival um, you know, by association and also they have uh, more uh, uh, or less hospitalized stays. And on the left, you see the summary data of that at one year. And, and these results were statistically significant uh, hypothesis generating. So this is the survival data from that. So we see a difference in overall survival. We don't really see a great difference in progression free survival. And uh, the, the main reason could be that maybe there is no difference in PFS, but the other reason could be that uh, on the PIPEC trial, we had an established protocol to uh, do imaging every two months. And if the difference is small in progression-free survival, um, then this could be missed. And also if it's not standardized, what progression is that could be missed. So I think this needs to be explored in, in the next study. So with that, this is kind of the concept we're at right now. Um, so based on these results, we would like to do a randomized trial where we would randomize to the third line systemic therapy based on uh, what it has been established through sunlight trial in colorectal cancer. And usually colorectal regimens are extrapolated to appendiceal cancer. So um, the reason to do two to one randomization is because BIPEC is starting to gain popularity as off-label treatment, which is not really the way we should be doing this. Um, and so, you know, motivated patients may find um, treatment uh, at other centers and may not want to enroll. So to incentivize this, um, you know, we're focusing on, on offering a higher chance of getting the intervention. Patients will be similar to the study that I presented, will be histologically con uh, confirmed. Uh, carcinomatosis from colorectal appendiceal. Um, there's other inclusion criteria listed for targeted therapies. They should have received those and they should not be refractory to the third line regimen that we're proposing uh, in the control arm. The patients should have relatively reasonable performance status and life expectancy. And there's some exclusions for patients who do really poorly and are not really uh, amenable for an intervention based study. The primary outcome we're proposing is a uh, number of good days and there are other exploratory endpoints. Um, there's some um, justification for sample size on the next slide. Um, and this is just preliminary, but I would love feedback on the stat side of things, um, you know, as to what the best way to approach this would be. So with that, thank you. Yes. Uh Maggie Sintel from UCI. Dr. Rowe, first of all, congratulations in doing that initial PIPAC study. I know how challenging it is to do these kind of studies in extremely ill patients. So one, I, one comment and probably two questions. The comment is you highlighted the importance of radiology in evaluating that progression. And I would attest to that, you know, doing another study with peritoneal carcinomatosis, even though we have really thought about laparoscopy as the best way to evaluate peritoneal disease. After regional therapy, evaluation by laparoscopy is challenged by the extensive scar tissue we end up seeing in the abdominal cavity. And hence, your data just confirms what we think, that the radiological progression would be an important factor or important way to assess response to treatment. So thank you for highlighting that. The question, in terms of the, the study that you're proposing, the exclusion criteria included extraperitoneal metastasis, but you were willing to include lung lesions that are less than five lung lesions that are less than a centimeter. Can you expand on why you have thought that lung lesions would be a favorable group to include in this uh, peritoneal disease? The other one is regarding the data you presented with the PIPAC-1 study, you showed that the conversion rate or conversion, there were about two patients who were converted, 17% conversion rate, small study. However, how did you define conversion? Uh, meaning, what was there a PCA cutoff that was chosen to decide that these patients were not candidates for cytoreduction and then were able to undergo conversion? So if you could just comment on the criteria initially for undersectability or not a candidate for cytoreduction. Yeah, th thank you very much for those questions. So very insightful. I think the... Um... So the first question was about the uh, uh, re uh, laparoscopic response rate. Uh, you know, the PCI assessment is for sure limited, 
But what we find is that um, in terms of radiographic assessment, while radiographic assessment will miss a lot of disease uh, and is not as accurate, but when patients do progress, I think it is meaningful for survival. So I think, you know, and also with the infrastructure to assess resist based progression, I think that could be a, a meaningful endpoint, um, maybe if not primary, a secondary endpoint. Um, in terms of the cytoreductive surgery candidacy, to, to our minds, those patients were not candidates for cytoreduction. It was not, it was only a secondary endpoint of the trial uh, to look at efficacy signal bit because there's so much um, haziness around resectability criteria in our field. Uh, I don't think that would be a meaningful endpoint. We cannot declare success. And there's so much variation how we call some things uh, cytoreducible or not. And the value of cytoreduc cytoreduction in these refractory patients is also questionable. So I think um, we report it because, you know, that's what people want to know about this cohort. Um, but I, I, I think that that could, you know, in our, in our eyes, those patients should not have undergone surgery but you know, nonetheless, we're taken to complete side reduction. So, Dr. Sham. Thanks for that outstanding presentation. Um, and thank you for developing trials to evaluate new technologies in a rigorous way as they roll out, not you know, five, 10 years after they roll out. Two questions. One, um, is there any evidence about differential response to HIPEC based on genomic signatures, KRAS interest status? I would imagine that. Um, there's an opportunity to either have inclusionary or exclusionary criteria based on that, and that may affect some of your secondary outcomes, but that would hurt your sample size, obviously. Uh, and then second question along the feasibility uh, line, how many centers have these nebulizers? Um, I, I know for Hedge, we don't have one. Uh, I realize that it's, it's becoming more popular, but in order to get that number, at the current rate of use, I would imagine that you're gonna face some feasibility challenges just from people having the equipment necessary to do the procedure. Can you comment on that? Yeah, great points. I think that's kind of what we've been working with, um, trying to uh, establish feasibility. So last October, we conducted a, a PIPAC workshop and, and trained about 50 surgical oncologists um, across the nation. The, the good thing about this compared to HIPAC is that there's not a huge learning curve. It's a laparoscopic procedure. and from a technical standpoint, you know, you just need to know the logistics rather than the technical aspects of the, the procedure itself. Um, I think the from the feasibility standpoint, there's there's uh, three, this was done as a multi-center study. So there's three centers that were part of this. So we have those three centers, but we're hoping to expand on the network and, and in, include other centers, including, you know, UW as part of the, uh, ongoing trial or the planned trial. And uh, um, in terms of your question about the mutational status, we we did look at mutational status for our patients. So most of them were KRAS mutant. A uh, few of them were KRAS wild type. Too small to, you know, parse out whether PIPEC was effective one group or the other. Yeah, brief comment. Uh, While well, you're correct that uh, there is a shorter learning curve or shallower learning curve for surgeons, uh, it's really more of an implementation and systems question. Like our surgeons went to went to that mm -hmm. uh, course, but still it involves perfusionists and the OR staff. And really, I think I see that as really the barrier writ large, not that kind of surgeon experience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think there is now um, track record of how to do it at three different sites. You know, Northwell, um, uh, Mayo Clinic, Jacksonville, and a City of Hope. So, so we have some expertise with setting that up and. I think that's an infrastructure we will need to establish for this study. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, is is uh, Dr. Blanke or Dr. Fairman? Here, I saw Dr. Blanke earlier. I'll just give a brief update then uh, for the uh, depression screening and treatment of patients requesting MAID or medical aid in dying. That was um, submitted as a, if for those that remember, that was originally a, a study that went to the steering committee, uh, was not approved, and then the U34, this format came a, a, along for basically studies to explore if they can happen. For the U34, essentially it's a two-year grant. If you're doing what you say you're doing, essentially you, you can get four extra years, so it's ultimately a six-year grant. And so that's being reviewed now. And so hopefully we'll get um, positive feedback. 
in the very near future. Um, the next thing I'll give a brief update is uh, that we as a um, have had a secondary analysis approved by the uh, Hope Foundation, which for those that know, that's that's the mechanism to do secondary analyses through SWOG. Um, we're on the statistical queue now, and we'll hopefully um, sometime after New Year uh, be able to um, start to look at the data. We'll see. Basically, the premise is we really want to look at depression as an entity for um, studies within SWOG, which are many dealing with advanced cancer, and try to better understand the incidence and ultimately important importance of, um, of uh, depression for our patients. So more to come, and we'll, we'll, um, we'll, 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 we'll hopefully have something to present either next meeting or the meeting after. I will say, though, it's a great opportunity for other members of our committee to potentially um, do an anal uh, do analyses, not necessarily answer questions, but sometimes begin begin to um, ask better questions through through that mechanism. So look on the website and um, and um, if you want to talk to Marie or I, we can help hopefully facilitate that process. Okay, so. You're up. So do we have, you have my one slide? Yes. Awesome. So I'm just going to give, so S1316, we, uh, which we've been updating serially, we've, we've finally over the summer had our primary manuscript published in uh, Lancet Gastroenterology Hepatology. Um, and so once that happens, ultimately the, 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 I mean, that's the, obviously the, primary thing, and then the data can more easily be shared with others as well. The, the um, Dr. Cindy Thompson, who was mentioned earlier at, at Arizona, who led for that particular study looking at uh, dietary changes, we're in the process um, of doing, or, or she's actually, the analysis is done, the paper's in, in progress, and our target is nutrition and cancer. Um, and then uh, we have a lot of data related to quality of life. Uh, and and for the for the main paper, we looked at ostomy, or I'm sorry, bowel, bowel obstruction specific symptoms, pain and bloating, nausea, vomiting. But we have these overall instruments that we're going to look in look at, including the EQ5D, where you can look at utilization or qualities. And so Amy Ludwig, uh, who is um, at Mayo Clinic. Um, and as part of Alliance, and we have a, um, a relationship with with her for a long time, is um, in the process of going through uh, to get the data transferred to her to do these analyses. Um, we're going to hopefully start soon analysis, sub-analyses, looking at the ovarian cancer population and comparing to a known score called the Henry score. Um, um, and evaluating that as a u utility for patients with malignant bowel obstruction. That's out of our team at Duke University, which was a high accruer on our study. Um, Dr. Deneve, who was at the um, University of Tennessee in Memphis and was the number one accruer for S1316, he's now at um, UNC in Chapel Hill. And one of the things we were able to do for this study is have data forms looking at all the specific um, issues related to the, the operation itself. And so hopefully he's going to discern uh, some of the um, different operations or different um, sort of decision-making factors that can uh, improve uh, care for these patients. And we're also... Um, in the process of a, a lessons learned paper. Well, you know, the, there's a lot of novelties to S1316, including the population, including the sort of disparate treatment um, treatments that were uh, in each arm. And so, and we had to go through to complete the study to accrue, we had to do quite a few am amendments. And we're sort of looking at those um, and do, gonna do a very formal analysis um, and hopefully, uh, paper will come out from that in the future. Okay. Thanks. Um, and did you want to mention your recent uh, nomination of your paper for 
an award? Well, it was, it was nominated from Penn Ford as a nomination for a clinical, uh, sort of a top 10 uh, for the year of clinical research. And so hopefully have positive <laughs> updates no, next time. It's just plenty. So congratulations yeah. on that. Um, I uh, missed a question from Katie Arnold on the depression secondary analysis. Um, she's asking, how will you identify patients with depression? This is not commonly collected on yes. SWOG studies. So it, it, it actually is collected in quite a few SWOG studies based on a lot of the different surveys that have that data. So, um, so, so, and we're also Dr. Fairman, who's also part of this as a psychiatrist will be. So it's, it's and, and technically you're right. It's not depression. It's, it's indicators of depression because depression, of course, is a diagnosis that takes quite a bit of, of workup, but there are screening tools um, and there are questions within um, the surveys that we will utilize to get indications of depression. So you're, you're absolutely right. We can't really say depression, but we can say indicators of depression. Perfect. Thank you. Oops. Um, thank you so much. And of course, we heard from Dr. Sun, but just to re-acknowledge that is one of our closed studies. And um, uh, thank you again for that. Um, in terms of new concepts, uh, we have a cycle of mentorship that we're observing in this agenda, in case any of you had missed it, where Dr. Krauss spoke about um, uh, Dr. Marcia Grant, and also I had Dr. Betty Farrell from City of Hope as a mentor to me and to you and to Virginia, and then you have mentored some of us in being in SWAG, and so then I mentored Nick, and so now we have another mentee, uh, Dr. Jackie Wall, who is currently a an instructor in, and also um, a relatively newly minted GYN oncologist who is at the University of Alabama at Birmingham as a T32 doctoral fellow of mine. I'm very um, excited to promote her work. And she is going to talk to us about her um, uh, Charles A. Coltman Fellowship application to HOPE, which is um, awaiting review. Um, nevertheless, she is moving um, very rapidly in her field uh, as a leader in the palliative um, and supportive care realm in uh, GYN oncology. And she is going to present her uh, concept on improving palliative and supportive care utilization in women with gynecologic cancers. So um, Dr. Wall. Good morning, can everybody hear me okay? Great, we can hear you. Can you okay, see the awesome. slides? Yes, I can. And I will cue you for when to forward them. So thank you so much. Um, Yes, I'm very appreciative for the opportunity to prevent to present this concept this morning. So thank you so much for your time and attention um, and hopefully some you know helpful feedback that we can incorporate in moving this forward. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so every year there are about over 100,000 new cases of GYN cancer diagnosed and approximately 33,000 cancer deaths. Um, black women are more often presenting with advanced stage disease and they also have higher disease, spe disease specific um, mortality compared to white women. And while the distribution of disease and physical impact may vary slightly depending on the primary cancer site, um, these cancers collectively impart high degrees of both physical and emotional suffering. Bleeding, pain, and GI dysfunction are very common and frequently cited side effects in these patients. Um, and up to 95% of patients report pain as something that significantly impart, impacts their quality of life on a daily basis. Um, further, emotional distress, anxiety are quite widespread. Um, in prior work that we did at our institution found that over half of ovarian cancer patients reported moderate, moderate or severe distress that was again interfering with their daily quality of life. So given the complex interplay of these physical and emotional symptoms, these patients are ideal candidates for ongoing palliative care. Um, however, while the introduction of early palliative care is clearly recommended by multiple medical societies, rates of its utilization early and in total in GYN cancer is, is very low. Um, this tends to hover around the 20% range um, from what we found in the existing literature. And further, the majority of these referrals to specialty palliative care take place within 30 days of patient death. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, much of the existing research in palliative care use in gynecologic cancer is limited and it's very focused on care transitions at the end of life. And we need a lot more research and more robust research in order to understand what barriers are existing so that we can consistently implement timely palliative care. And basically as this, if there's a continued lack of high quality care research in this area, um, this will prevent the development of targetable and actionable clinical interventions, which will potentially lead to prolonged physical emotional suffering, poor quality of life, increased medically ineffective interventions at the end of life, increased care costs, and an inefficient allocation of very limited palliative care resources. And while this was limited um, to patients with cervical cancer, a recent, recent um, re retrospective analysis that we conducted looking at palliative care use patterns at UAB showed that over a five-year period, only 17.5% of patients were referred to receive palliative care services in the treatment of their disease. Um, what we found was that those who referred were actually younger. Um, they had higher stage disease. They were more likely to have recurrent disease and to have received um, more total treatment. Um, we did not observe any differences according to patient race, but we additionally found that only 20% of these patients were referred within the six, first six months of their cancer diagnosis regardless of their cancer stage. Um, next slide, please. So as there are very limited studies, and in particular, there are no clinical trials that are investigating the use of palliative care in gynecologic cancer, our goal is to investigate the palliative care needs of women with these cancers by conducting an in-depth in analysis of the existing patient reported outcomes data of women enrolled um, in SWOG institutions and cancer cooperative group clinical trials. Um, so our specific aims are first, to characterize the palliative care needs of women with gynecologic cancers enrolled in clinical trials. Um, secondly, to explore the experience of women who have a new GYN cancer diagnosis, looking at their physical and psychosocial needs, as well as their perspectives on palliative and supportive care services early in the treatment of their disease. And finally, to examine and to compare women's symptom experiences reported um, by interview quality of life instruments. So our um, proposal is really guided by a combination of two systems-based frameworks that are related to the implementation and, develop and delivery of palliative care services. The first um, is the conceptual framework by Zimmerman, which is um, for team-based outpatient palliative care, which emphasizes both principles and domains of care, um, as well as a um, TLC model, which highlights the palliative care incorporation that is both timely, team-oriented, longitudinal, collaborative, and comprehensive. So these frameworks are applicable because they both really emphasize the importance of collaboration between Joanne oncologists and palliative care specialists and an approach that's really holistic, focusing on quality of life as well as ones that acknowledge patients' um, ultimate mortality. Um, next slide, please. So going into the design of this proposal a little bit further, um, what we're looking to do with the quantitative aim of the study is to characterize palliative care needs of women um, enrolled in clinical trials. So how we plan to accomplish this is by retrospective analysis, um, and we will include all of the historic SWOG um, clinical trials that included patients with a primary gynecologic malignancy. These will largely provide us with a historic context, given that um, a lot of these cancers have not been included in the studies um, for like a pretty extended period of time. Um, but we're going to be looking at the, um, patient, the PROs and quality of life data that's available. Um, and then what we also plan to do is to use um, the existing data and other cooperative group trials within the past 10 years so that we can compare both historical context as well as what's going on um, more recently. Um, next, please. <clears throat> um, collect you know, the um, appropriate demographic information, including patient age, race, ethnicity, their employment and marital status, highest education, um, insurance status, and then use the um, existing trial records to determine their cancer history, which will include their primary cancer site, stage, um, and treatment history. Um, in assessing their PROs and quality of life data, um, the instruments that are used really do vary across the studies. Um, and so all validated instruments would be included. So examples of that would be like the Fact Quality of Life Survey, the EORTC um, Comprehensive, um, the CLQ, QLQ C30, as well as the Functional Assessment of um, Chronic Illness Therapy. Also um, would be looking at the study tables and results which are disclosing the presence and absence of any physical and emotional symptoms, toxicity grading, and things like that. 
Um, for our second aim, we are going to be conducting semi-structured interviews with the goal enrollment of approximately 50 patients. Um, and the goal of this is to really identify the themes that um, women experience and who have a new diagnosis of a gynecologic cancer um, relative to both their palliative care needs, understanding, and quality of life. Um, we'll also obtain their perspectives on receiving palliative care services early in the course of their illness. And um, we will have an a standard interview template for semi-structured interview that will consist of open-ended questions that focus on their cancer diagnosis, their current and planned treatments, their palliative care um, knowledge, as well as hospice knowledge. Um, on the previous slide, sorry, I um, may have said to advance, I didn't mean to, but they will also complete a quality of life assessment at the same time, the fact survey that is specific for their type of GYN cancer. Um, thinking um, advanced now, please. Um, these are some sample interview questions from our interview guide. Um, we're currently using a similar inter interview guide for a, um, a small study looking at cervical pan cancer patients in particular at UAB. So really just asking, you know, tell me about the experience you had finding out you had, you know, cervical cancer. What kinds of treatment have you had or are you planning to have? Has your care team spoken with you about the side effects of your treatment? And then looking at their palliative care knowledge, what is your understanding of the medical specialty called palliative care? So what we found is that many of these patients don't realize that it's its own specialty and it doesn't just refer to hospice. Um, they'll be read a description of palliative care and asked how they think that this could play a role in their cancer treatment, both now and in the future. And so what our plan is, is to use the findings from this research to identify targetable areas to help develop, to guide the development of interventions to improve early specialty palliative care integration into patients who have gynecologic cancers. Um, we we'll use the results to really identify um, what needs patients have and then use that to develop an early palliative care intervention um, using a multiple multidisciplinary advisory panel to help develop some pilot studies. So this panel would consist of joint oncologists, palliative care specialists, nurses, um, nurse navigators, and patient advocates. Um, the goal of these pilot studies will be to test the strategies to increase early palliative, early palliative care use and referral, and then subsequently to design um, the first randomized controlled trial of early palliative care implementation in gynecologic cancer. That's terrific. Um, yeah. um, Becky, I love your um, uh, plotting of your career that we'll be able to say in a couple years that we knew you when, when you are famous uh, doing your studies in um, SWAG and elsewhere. So thanks. Does anybody have any um, specific comments or questions for Dr. Wall at this time? Okay. Thank you well, so much. We will gather information for you. Sorry that you couldn't make it to the meeting. We know you had a, a major family um, event that you needed to uh, be part of. And so we're glad that you could come uh, virtually to, uh, to meet everyone. We look forward to coming next time. Yes, thank you so much. Great. Um, so, uh, and there's Jackie's um, email if anybody has any questions or you certainly can get to her through, through me. Um, last but not least, we have some uh, pre-SWOG pilot study updates, and uh, Dr. Jamie Myers is coming to the podium to give us a couple of quick updates there. Um, I will be presenting a brief update on our HOPE work, and then um, Dr. Krista braun Inglis will be coming up to uh, give us an update on the APP task force. So um, here you go. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Just a real quick update on two pilots that are pre-SWOG. Both of these are utilizing a device called a Ready Watch, which uses an algorithm that was developed by the Department of Defense as part of an SBIR to look at cumulative sleep metrics and then calculate a Ready Score, which is an estimate of the amount of fatigue someone would experience throughout the day based on three previous days of sleep, and also their cognitive readiness throughout the day. The algorithm actually is 92% accurate compared to polysomnography, and it pairs with an app called Ready One, which goes on the wearer's uh, phone, and it's a wrist-worn device, much like a watch, and it does tell time and count steps and heart rate and some other things that might be of interest. So in both these pilots, 
participants wear this device for two months and they have access to their sleep metrics as well as their ready one score and they have access to sleep hygiene education modules so the pilot on the left hand side of your screen is uh, one that was conducted at Prisma Health and University of South Carolina by Dr. Lauren Fowler. She was actually involved a little bit in the SBIR for which this app was developed. She recruited women with breast cancer who were receiving active endocrine therapy. The women were instructed to wear the watch for two months and then pre post patient reported outcomes were measured specifically looking at fatigue and cognitive function and sleep disturbance. They also looked at pain interference. She originally had the goal of enrolling 50. Uh, she did enroll 33. And some of her findings are there for you on the slide. There was an improvement post where for sleep quality on the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. And we did see inverse correlation with those ready scores both for the insomnia severity ratings, as well as for pain interference. So the pilot on the right-hand side of your slide is the one that we're conducting at the University of Kansas Cancer Center. And it's for men with prostate cancer who are receiving active androgen deprivation therapy. The same design, except this is a two-arm, and half the men are randomized to a virtual four-week cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia intervention. And we're doing the same measures pre-post. We have a goal of enrolling 40, and I'm uh, cautiously optimistic that if we have no further attrition, we are at our enrollment mark and are on target to have our data by the end of the year. So we'll be coming back, hopefully, with some ideas to move this type of technology forward um, in a SWOG concept in the future. Excellent. Thanks um, so right. much, Jamie. Can I ask one quick question? Quick question. Oh, a quick question. Yeah. So in the pilot that was done at Prisma and they targeted 50 and got 33, what was the reason why they couldn't attain Oh, great their... question. And um, she couldn't be here today, so I'm reporting for her. Part of the issue was slow startup, uh, given IRB approvals and some of the other things that have to happen at a site. And the expensive part of this study is the cost of the licensure for the algorithm and the licenses ran out before enrollment did so it wasn't an accrual issue no they had excellent um accrual and very little attrition great thanks and it certainly bodes well for a future study in swag our fingers are crossed um and Dr. Feldman, are you able to unmute to uh, am, yeah. give us a quick update on the Hope Enhancement Workshops work? Sure, I'll make it very, very brief because uh, I know we're a little pressed for time. So as you know, uh, Ben Korn and myself and many others, Mark O'Rourke, uh, Marie Bakaitis, Robert Krauss, Matt Hudson, and as I said, many others have been working uh, diligently on um, investigating hope in the context of cancer care. Uh, we've done a, a, a number of studies and, and most prominently have produced a single session psychosocial hope intervention uh, that was based on some of my work and then has most recently added an app called Hope Demise that was developed by um, Ben Korn and his wife, uh, Devorah's uh, NGO in Israel called Life's Door. Uh, we have recently published a piece in JNCI Cancer Spectrum that you can see there at the top, which is really a very small feasibility study of uh, the online version of this HOPE workshop intervention, plus the app uh, in Oncology Professionals. Some of you actually were participants in that study, and we indeed did find that it was, it was feasible, and we had some post measures of some acceptability. We now have some ongoing studies or some concepts as well in development, and you can see a couple of them there. The first is a single session hope enhancement workshop um, uh, concept uh, for oncology healthcare professionals. So this is kind of an extension of the previous research. This is really adding acceptability to the mix in addition to feasibility and also getting some pre-post measures, uh, looking at the uh, efficacy uh, or, or I suppose effectiveness in some sense of this workshop uh, for uh, burnout in healthcare professionals. And this is funded through Pris Prisma Health Cancer Institute. 
uh, and the University of South Carolina Greenville School of Medicine and Life's Door, the nonprofit that I that I mentioned earlier. It has been a long, a, a, a difficult uh, trip uh, getting this through IRB at Prisma. Um, uh, it is now submitted to IRB under review. Actually, we just received some comments today, which seem uh, fairly manageable as we're moving forward. One of the difficulties was that IT at uh, Prisma really wanted to very carefully vet the app to make sure that it really stood up to security and confidentiality, which it, it turns out that it does. So we're moving forward there. The other is a similar study, a single session hope enhancement uh, workshop study. Uh, again, pre-post measures, feasibility and acceptability for women with metastatic breast cancer on endocrine therapy. And of course, endocrine therapy is very challenging to hope in some sense because it has fairly in intense side effects, as I'm sure everyone knows. And again, this is funded through the same funders and the IRB application is in draft form and we're going through the same process with submission shortly. We've also completed a full revision, actually Life's Door did, um, uh, of the Hope to My Smartphone app. So if, if any of you and some of you have used it in the past, it's functionally sort of equivalent, but we've added many additional features. It's a lot slicker. The animations are, are really cool. Uh, and we're using that moving forward as an intervention tool uh, and data collection tool in these workshops. So uh, that is my update. I don't know if Ben wants to add anything before we close up. I think he's on the call. Yes, Ben's been on the call, but I'm not sure if we can get through. So, and we are a little pressed for time. So, um, thank you. Um, why don't we go ahead and move on to um, Dr. Braun Inglis? But thanks so much for your update, and um, thanks so much for joining us for the meeting. Um, and so, uh, as I said, last but not least is the SWAG ABP task force, and we have um, an update slide on, on that. Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Krista Brown Inglis, and I am leading the uh, SWAG ABP task force along with Jamie Myers, and really appreciate the palliative and end of life uh, committee support. Uh, we put in for Hope Foundation funding that we received about two years ago. And in 2022, we were able to do a symposium to highlight how oncology APPs can enhance clinical research. And then a year ago, we put on an APP specific workshop. And that workshop is actually available online now for three hours of CME. There is promotion going on around uh, SWAG right now for that workshop because we've had really little uptake of that workshop since we put it online. So we want people to know it's out there, it's available. There are handouts out, um, at the registration desk and there's also a QR code going through uh, the promotion out there too. Um, we were able to put together an APP task force and it's funding uh, APPs from NCTN sites and NCORE sites to come to the meetings to address barriers um, in APP practice and NCI trials, as well, as well as help to integrate APPs more into SWOG. Um, and we are we recently addressed a DTL issue that we are able that we are seeing was affecting our practice on SWOG protocols. So we are actually able to address that and change practice there. Um, we're working with the Pharmaceutical Sciences Committee on the Computer Prescri Prescribing Order Entry Project. And again, as I said, we're continuing to integrate APPs into SWOG because we believe they can enhance clinical research. So. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, you can ask me, Jamie, Marie, um, any of us. So thank you. Well, um, and thank you so much, Krista, because your um, your and Jamie's and uh, also Virginia's energy in keeping the uh, momentum going in the APP group to um, maximize their use, especially in enrollment and accrual. Yeah, and I do have to acknowledge Virginia, son, because Virginia was the first person that said, you know what, you should really put in a whole foundation proposal for this. So thank you, Virginia. Great, thank you. So we here we are, right on time, wrapping up. And uh, Dr. Krauss, any closing comments? Oh, yes. Um, uh, most importantly, 
Uh, many of you will notice that um, our third leg of our uh, tripod, Dr. Mark O'Rourke is not here with us. Um, Dr. O'Rourke retired in July and he is enjoying his retirement so much that he wasn't able to attend today to be acknowledged for all the wonderful work that he has done. Um, and including in this, uh, I wanted to also acknowledge our other uh, senior advisor, Dr. Frank Myskins, for all of the work that's been done to get this committee going. And I hope that you feel um, energized and proud for where we've been able to come and we're only at the beginning. So wanted to just acknowledge Dr. O'Rourke, Dr. Myskins as well. And um, in, the, in the ether, we are wishing him well on his retirement and hope he'll make an appearance at a, a future meeting. So, and, and we finally just appreciate all of you being here um, and participating. And if you, you or your teams where you are have ideas, please take them to us. Because as you can see, there's a lot going on, but we have great opportunities through this committee and we're hopeful to forward more, great, more of your great ideas. So thank you all. Great. And there's our upcoming um, full committee, committee meeting um, by uh, call. You should be getting calendar invites. Those of you who are on the, the roster list, it's a good reason to make sure you're on the roster list or you get on it um, so that you can join us for our full committee call. And then we will see you in San Francisco um, for the next hybrid meeting in April of 2024. Oh, I'm sorry. Wrong picture. <laughs> Seattle. Um, for those of you who want to go to San Francisco, it'll be nice, but we'll be in Seattle. Okay, thanks everybody and uh, enjoy the rest of the meeting.